Oh, hi there. Welcome to our video on airbrushing. I'm Bill, and this is Hank. Hi there. We're going to take you through the basics of airbrushing, from the very simplest concepts of what an airbrush is, the types of airbrushes, what they do, what the benefits of having and using an airbrush are, right through to a few techniques. We're going to lay down some paint right here live. Uh, we're hoping you didn't give up on us. We did have some technical difficulties earlier, and uh, we would love for any questions or that you'd like to bring into us while we're live. First of all, uh, what I'd like to do is I'd like to cover some of the basics of airbrushing. Uh, it's a little mysterious until you actually, you know, get some information about it and figure out uh, figure out the bits and pieces. Uh, one of the one of the big things, of course, is going to be your airbrush. Now, Bill, uh, he has a, a very fine example of what uh, what would be considered an ideal basic. Uh, beginner's airbrush. He's got a single action pash. Now, the thing about the single action pash is that it has one button for air, so you control that with one finger, and then it's going to have a separate little screw on the side, and that controls your paint. So you can either set it for a very fine line, and then you can go in and you can get all the details, or you can just open it up and just blast paint out and paint anything really quickly usually saving on the paint because if you try and uh, use a paintbrush you're going to use up a lot of paint. I have a dual action airbrush and it's, uh, it's considered a little bit more of an advanced airbrush. It's advanced only in the fact that it requires a lot of dexterity and a lot of practice uh, to actually get to know. It does have the, the trigger on the top so that we can actually press it down and get some air out which is good but the way that I control the paint is that I pull the trigger back and that allows me to either have a fine line or a thick line whenever I, whenever I want. So you, you, you do get quite a bit more control of this. As well, my airbrush is known as a gravity feed. It has a cup on the top and the paint literally gets grabbed through gravity and then pushed into the airbrush. Bill, on the other hand, has what's known as a suction feed and the, there's a cup that sits on the bottom and actually draws the paint up and out. Now there's benefits to both. Um, he can set his so that his is left-handed or right-handed depending on where the cup is on either side. Uh, with mine it doesn't really matter. I can go left-handed, I can go right-handed. Uh, it's comfortable either way. Another thing, all airbrushes are going to be pretty much well the same. Uh, one of the things that I recommend that you do is that you study the instructions that come with it and figure out how to take it apart and clean it because you'll be doing that a lot. Bill's doing it right now. He just sprayed a little bit of paint. He's going to clean out his airbrush, his cup, make sure that things are nice and clean for the next color. Next thing I want to talk about, and um, actually I think Bill's a little bit, uh, a little bit stronger in this field, is going to be the air types. Okay. Well, both uh, Hank and I are using compressors right now. Um, ours have auto shutoffs, which means when we're not actually spraying, they're not, they're not running. Uh, a lot of uh, airbrush uh, compressors feature this nice thing. It's, it's, I prefer to have it that way rather than one that runs all the time. They don't get as hot, and of course they don't annoy you as much. Now we've got, this would be considered a straight compressor, the top component, and then this is a tank. So what happens is the the air blows into the tank and then you bleed the tank out and it only runs to recharge the tank. Now even if it didn't have a tank on it, it may be an auto shut off. But what you have is when you're doing really fine work, you might notice pulsation from the compressor, from the piston or the diaphragm. Whereas when you bleed a tank, you do not have this. Uh, in the beginning, really your main option was a compressed air can that you hooked to a, a airbrush those have become very expensive they're in the 25 dollar range now and so you you use you know six to ten of these and you've bought a compressor so why would you plus this thing when you hook it up it spikes with air immediately then the air pressure drops and then it, you have to warm the can up it's a real pain and you'll never airbrush properly so if you have to use this do it but as soon as you can lose it get a compressor we have complete packages airbrush compressor and everything starting as low as 200 dollars the only time that I've ever used one of these is when I actually had to do 
car touch-ups uh, at people's garages in the middle of nowhere uh, back in Thunder Bay, Ontario, which was a long time ago. Okay, Hank is going to show you the real basic technique, which is just spraying paint even. Ah, this is something you practice and you master this before you move on to other techniques. Now, if anybody was noticing, I've been trying to keep my airbrush all nice and steady and whatnot, because if I don't, then it'll spill all over the ground and me. And if I ruin another pair of jeans, my wife is going to kill me. So let's start off. Now, I build everything. I build model cars, tanks, planes, spaceships, pretty much all everything you can think of. Rocket season is coming up. So guess what I got? I got a rocket, and it's in white, but I don't like white. So what I've done is that I've laid down some very gentle yellow masking tape all over the place to give it some stripes and I'm going to show you my technique I keep everything about eight ten inches away okay and you cannot see the stream usually when you airbrush but if you just continue from one side to the other nice and easy nice and easy You can get a really smooth finish quickly, and it'll dry in a few in the matter of a few minutes. All right. Are you going to do a little freehand camo, or would you like me to go on to something while you're setting up for that? Oh, if you could go on to something uh, right now, then I'll uh, All right. set something up. One of my uh, topics is uh, applying primer. Well, one of the products we sell here is a Vallejo Surface Primer. Please don't blame me if you come in and it's not in stock. Because of the pandemic, it's been hard keeping stock. This is an old bottle of black that I have. The beauty about Vallejo Primer, it's an acrylic, so it cleans up with water. If you saw my video about acrylic paint, keep in mind, all paints are acrylics. All acrylics are not water-based. This particular one is. So you can clean it with water. I like to use a bit of Windex because the ammonia in it cuts through it and really cleans it up. So this stuff, as advertised, it uh, can be brushed on with a paintbrush or it can be airbrushed right out of the bottle, which makes it advantageous for use. So I put some, I'm using my single action for laying down clear coats, primers, very basic stuff that maybe you would use a spray can for, but in this case it's a controlled one. This is an easy one for laying down one coats, single colors, uh, spraying auto bodies, real really simple jaws where you don't have to have the flexibility of a double action and be moving it around all the time. You set this thing up once, and then you're good to go. So in this case, I've got the paint in. I got it going. I seem to have a good flow there. So I'm side to siding it. I'm laying on my black primer. I'm going to put a bit of this on. Hopefully, by the time we set it up, it'll be a black underlay that I can put a little metalizer in. This metalizer work very well over black underplates. And if you'll notice, Bill is actually keeping his airbrush 8 to 10 inches away. Uh, I think that's around 15 centimeters or so. And he's keeping everything nice and flat. And he's working away from himself so that he doesn't get himself covered in paint. So that his wife doesn't kill him from ruining another pair of jeans. Exactly. Now keep in mind, we're in the hobby center live right now. Uh, we're in a big open space. We have lots of ventilations. We have ceiling Huge. fans going. Now, if you were doing this at home, in your basement, of course, we would highly recommend that you have some kind of a spray booth or a fan. But barring that, if you had to, there's always the good old respirator mask. It's very good for using solvent paints or any kind of paints. This keeps the particulate out of your lungs. And if there's fumes, it'll cut down on the fumes so you don't get nauseous or downright ill. You'll start with jokes. No Star Wars jokes. No Star Wars jokes. I am your father. Oh, sorry, I couldn't help myself. Anyhow, this could be a lifesaver. There was a lot of problems back in the 70s. One of the only paints you could buy at the time was colloquial lacquer. And there was a rash of gentlemen that passed away spraying that stuff in their basements under not perfectly well ventilated conditions. So people with weak hearts or lung conditions and that, this could be like a, a, late, a game changer for you. So I would recommend that you take all safety precautions, okay? It looks easy, it's acrylic paint, it's water-based, sounds great. Anything you get in your lungs is not necessary. Well, think of it, an acrylic polymer into your lungs. You might as well smoke, right, Hank? Yeah, as a matter of fact, I quit smoking six years ago, and uh, 
Yeah, I can I can tell the difference. And I do actually wear a mask when I'm airbrushing at home because uh, simply, yeah, my lungs are, are worth more than just one hobby. Um, I actually do have the same type of mask. Uh, it's about 18 years old, and I actually have to replace the straps on it now because the elastics are worn. But everything else, the rubber seal, um, the, uh, the, the types of canisters that you can get for the site, those are replaceable. You can buy replacements. You can get them on Amazon or eBay. You can even get them through Bill, uh, should Bill happen to get some stock. Again, they're hard to get. You can also get them from the hardware stores, which is, uh, which is also another really good idea. Uh, Bill was leading into the fact that I'm going to try some freehand camo and sh I'll show you just how easy it is. What I'm going to do, though, is that I'm going to take a fairly dark paint, and this is an acrylic. This is uh, I'm going to be using a little bit of uh, tomato. And true to form, if you want to mix up your paint and you don't have one of those little mixers, okay, uh, seriously, just leave it in your pocket, walk around for like an hour or so, and it'll be mixed up by the time you pull it back out. So I can open up my paint. I'll have a good look at it. It's pretty viscous, but it's uh, still too thick to uh, to put through an airbrush. Now, I used to be the type of person that would just simply use water or isopropyl alcohol or lacquer thin. Okay, uh, with the new type of acrylic lacquers that have been coming over from AK uh, and uh, the rest of the companies that are putting out the modern, newer types of paints, I go for their thinners. Uh, AK has real colors. Uh, let me see now. Tamea has lacquer and acrylic thinners. Wait, there's more. Uh, Vallejo has their airbrush thinner. And something I highly recommend with the Vallejo paints is their airbrush flow and uh, improver. It causes their paints to just turn into liquid gold. Once you get it thinned enough, you put a little bit of the airbrush uh, flow improver through it, and then, oh, it just flows right in there. Oh, look, uh, Hataka makes a thinner, thinner as well. And, uh, oh yeah, Life Color does. Yep, got to have that. And, uh, of course, Mr. Color has their Mr. Color 400, which is like one of the first ones that came out. And you know what? This works with almost everything. Okay, camouflage. Now, like I said, this paint was a little too thick to run through my airbrush right away. Now... Everybody asks me for painting ratios, you know, paint to thinner, what kind of, what kind of ratio do you actually want to choose? Um, when it comes to the Tamea, I find that 50-50 is good. And there's nothing, there's nothing all too, uh, too rocket, rocket science about this, even though we're going to be working on a rocket. But I'll put in a little bit of the acrylic paint. I'll put in about 50% of the acrylic thinner. I usually keep a brush or something around to uh, to uh, stir it all up. Hopefully, not spilling anything on my clothing or my pants, causing me to have a shorter marriage. And then I'll shoot it into my rag to figure out where my uh, uh, where my line is. And what I'm doing is just pushing it through and saying, "Hey, you know what? This is pretty darn good. This is thinned down to the right consistency." Now remember, I told you that if you're going to do something like, you know, straight cross and get a whole bunch of color in there, well then, you know, you can go 8 to 10 inches, you know, 15 to 20 centimeters. But, if you want to do camouflage, you can go a lot closer and then just tighten the stream with your dual action airbrush or tighten up the screw on your single action airbrush and always paint into your color. I'm not sure if this can actually be seen or not because we have bright lights. But the edge where my airbrush is, and I'm going really close, I'm only going perhaps two, three centimeters in, okay? That's nice and sharp because that's where the air is hitting and then bouncing out. Everything on the other side is really feathered. So as long as you consider where your camouflage is going to go,
Ha! Now I have two sharp lines where my camouflage starts, and then everything on the inside, which is going to be color anyway, is going to be a nice soft line. And then I can fill it in as I go. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah that's pretty good. So I'll get a nice... So I'll get a nice camouflage line in there. And it's got a soft demarcation line, so it's as if somebody, you know, had sprayed it with a spray painter uh, out on out in the field. Nice sir. It's one down. You're setting up for another technique. I'll set up for another. All right. Before we went on the air, uh, I prepped a little thing here, and I'll show you what I did. I uh, took a truck body here. I painted it this dull brown color. Actually, it's meant to represent like a rust shade. It's a red brown. So what I did on one side is I did what is called the hairspray technique. And the other side, I did the mask dabbing technique. So on the front half of this, before the shooting, I sprayed the color. I took my hairspray and I put a liberal coating of hairspray on. Hairspray is like an acrylic lacquer. It's a clear coat the ladies put in their hair. And of course, it washes out when you're done with it. That's why it makes a good weathering technique. While this is still wet, I put some, I put some salt on. Now I'm saying I'm sending it out of a shaker, so I'm really getting a lot. If you do your fingers, you can put it more precisely where you want. Rub it in. Um, I've even taken this and made a little miniature mortar pestle and ground it up even finer into more of a dust. If you don't want the coarseness of the salt, so I'd already did that at the front. Then on the other side, I took a uh, Molotow liquid mask marker. So we all know about liquid masks. They're usually some kind of latex. You put them on clear parts or, you, or whatnot and uh, use them as you would a mask tape, but it's in a liquid form. So earlier, I took my truck body and I took my masking agent and I did little dips and dabs here and there. Random streaks, little dips and bobs. You can also do it with a paintbrush and the liquid mask that comes in a jar, which hangs over here. This is Mr. Masking Fluid. So you could use a jar or a toothpick or something, and you could liberally put it on. So when this stuff goes dry, it kind of gets kind of clear looking. So I put away my single action patch airbrush and switched out to a double action, which, like Hanks, you push down for air, you pull back to add as much paint as you require. This is sucking from the bottom, which means it's taking it from this cup. I have a whole selection of different cups I have from who knows what. So sometimes they sit at odd angles. There's ones for left-handed use, which I think was the one I had in the other airbrush. But I'm just using this one for now. I pre-mix my paint. I'm a little more of a one-third, two-thirds guy. So I usually start with one-third thinner, two-thirds paint. But my airbrushing is a little coarser than Hank's. Hank's does a lot finer work. I'm a more of a you know saturation guy. So I'm going to start at the front where I already applied my, uh, my uh, hairspray and my salt. And I'm just going to start putting, this will be the finished color of the truck, which I control the metallic blue. So you see, just like I'm painting a really good finish on my truck, I'm going to put it on even, and neatly, and smoothly. But I'm putting it right over the hairspray and the salt. So as you can see, I'm laying color, my final color over my pre-shading, which was meant to be a rust or a dingy color. Okay. Now I'm going to go to the other side and do the same thing over the liquid masking that I did over. If you want to lay it on a little heavier, or pull back a little further, I want to do a little less. These off on the trigger. Keep it moving. Really watch what's going on. We're so going to avoid runs and grips. Love the pan paint. Look how nicely that lays on. That's in with their thinner, which is primarily an alcohol-based thinner. Click. Go to the back where I just applied the hair rush, hair spray, and the salt. Put it on a nice coat. I like this finish so much, it's a shame I'm going to mess it up. <laughs>
That is nice. I like that color blue. Now, really ideally, good. I should probably let it set up a bit longer because I'm, I'm going to run a risk of taking some of the paint I just laid down. But the nice thing about acrylic, it is dry to the touch fairly quickly. So with an old toothbrush or something similar, you can go over this and you would use some water. You see? It starts to take away the hairspray. And I leave a distressed, you know, streaky looking thing underneath. This paint is far too wet to be doing this. And again over here, I would find, I would see where my liquid masks were applied, and I would remove them. And I would end up with a blotch. Where each time I put a little blop on, I take my toothbrush and I'd scrub this. See, you need this paint to be set up. If I took a toothbrush to this right now wet, I would just remove all the paint. You don't want that. You just want to distress the little spots of masking, and you want to distress and dissolve the salt. I suppose you could do it with sugar too, same idea, right? It's water soluble material. So once you distress this with a brush or what have you, and a little bit of water, you just, you know, you just remove it. See, it's coming off there. That gives a little better idea of what you can kind of expect. So I did this all in like an hour or less. So, you know, you would spray your undercoat, you would let that perfectly set up, then you would start playing with your mask and your hairsprays and all that. You would let that set up. And then you would spray this finish coat. You'd let that set up. And then you'd start mucking about with it. I'm, re I'm really rushing it here for the sakes of demonstration. But I think you get the idea. Besides, this isn't a race, right? You're trying to make something really nice. You're trying to make some kind of, well, I consider it art. It's kind of a sculpture. Okay. Next technique. How many of you, when you were a kid, had silly putty? Great stuff, silly putty. Not sure what they make, or how they make it, or what it's made of, but it's awesome. This is something that we found out quite some time ago, is that you can actually spray either oil-based or acrylic-based paints over a silly putty, and the silly putty just absorbs it. So, and it's also kind of sticky, right? So, how about using it for masking? If you notice here on the mask, okay, I've got the, the wing and this part of the fuselage here, and this brown stuff here isn't the silly putty. It was originally kind of a pinkish color, but this is what happens after, you know, using it for a year or so. So I've got my silly putty on here. I've got the same brown paint as I had before, and I'm going to use the same technique as we did before, which is just simply going over it back and forth. Now again, I'm making sure that it's a nice, fair distance away. I'm not really close into it. Then I'm going to make it all nice and brown, painting over the silly putty. Oh, yeah, yeah. Again, I'm using the Tamiya paints, and just like Bill said, the Tamiya paints just flow right over everything. And the nice thing is, is that it dries fairly quickly. Now the thing about Silly Putty is that if you notice on this side I've got this wheel well back here and it's an odd shape and it's just a box so you could tape it, you could spend your time taping it, cutting the tape around it, or you could just simply fill it with Silly Putty and it's a mask for your undercarriage. So, I can just spray right around it now, and I don't have to worry about painting on the inside. <laughs> oh, yeah. Now, while it's like this, if I wanted to, I could fade out this paint by adding a little bit of white or a little bit of yellow to it and then the brown suddenly becomes a lighter brown like it's been sitting in the sun. But beware, once you're finished and you start removing the, the silly putty, that's it. Trying to get the silly putty to fit back where it was before, not fine. But, it just comes right off and I've got hard masks. Ah, there we go. See, you can see it right now. 
brown and green just painted on there like nothing. And again, that was done in what, like what, five, ten minutes? And what's the next one you've got for us? Well, before I go to that, Hank, I just want to remind you of something. I was just uh, changing colors on these airbrushes to get around clean in between. And I was reminded how much volume of paint is in between the input here on a siphon feed airbrush up to the tip. So when you clean this, you change the color. There's all that paint is sitting in there. Okay? I remember going to an IPMS meeting years ago and a fellow named Jamie demonstrated how you take your airbrush, use an eyedropper, put your mixed paint into there, and use it upside down for very small jobs, like streaking exhaust streaks and that, without breaking out a cup and a jar and whatever have you. You just set it up like that, shoot it upside down, and you can do a quickie job with a quickie clean up in seconds. You might be more inspired to use an airbrush more often for those little jobs where you, ah, I'll just use a paintbrush. Don't do it. Set this thing up and go. So, back when I did the primer for you, there it is, pretty well set up. It is not dry, it is not cured. The rule for paint, I find, I don't know how you roll Hank, is if you can smell the paint, it's not dry. Yeah. If you can't smell it anymore, you should be good to go. So that's your, your easy test. Smell it, I can still smell it, so it's really not ready yet. Okay, but this is black. I laid down a nice coat of black on this chassis. Now what I've done is I've put a product into my airbrush, which is unique to airbrush. That's metalizer or metallic finishes. In this case, I'm using Alclad. This is a bright silver base they make. They also make chrome, stainless steels. They make other things like that. So I've loaded my airbrush, my single action with that, because again, this is a simple single action job. So there's no need to use my double action. So I've set it up, I've added the paint, and I'm just going to lay on the paint. At least that's the idea. I left the brush alone for a couple seconds. There we go. See it going on? This paint really only works with an airbrush. You lay it on smoothly, you put it over a black base. In this case, I put a, it was more like a semi-gloss base, so that might dumb the color down. Had I used a gloss black, you would probably have a much brighter finish. But being as a mini, I think you can see, that's quite a good metallic look I'm getting on. I think this is a candy silver look. If you have time, you may put a clear coat over that to show you what it can do as a base itself. So in this case, I put a black base. I'm spraying on my aluminum, my shiny aluminum. Shiny. Now, as you can see here, I also put it over plain white plastic. See how it doesn't pop as well as it did over the black? I don't know if it shows on there. But it really doesn't pop. The black gives it a back reflection, which really sets it off. And in the case of the chrome, it starts to pop it. There, I just made a metallic truck model. Yes. Now, the the lacquer base is fine, but if you are constricted to, for instance, working in an apartment, it's going to be rather snowy. There is an alternative, something that I've been experimenting with as soon as it came out, and Vallejo actually makes an acrylic, and this is perhaps the best acrylic that we've seen so far for the uh, for getting a nice metallic uh, finish. It is a little finicky though, okay, and I'll try and explain that to you as we go. For one, it does require that you have a smooth, smooth primer underneath. Now, this is a this is the tank to the. Uh, MiG-27 clogger that I am actually making up. And it should be in silver. So what I'm going to do, the nice thing about the Vallejo stuff is, uh, of course, it comes with a little eyedropper already included. Okay. So I add a few drops just to make sure that it's in there. And that should be enough so that you're not going to be wasting paint. Now, I have primed this. This has got a, this has got a shiny gray primer all over it. And the primer is uh, is an acrylic primer, okay? And it's dried for two days, and that's about the minimum that I'll let it sit for. And again, what I'm going to be doing is very, very basic, very light coats, and because this is the finicky thing about this acrylic, uh, is that if you put it on too thick, it'll make 
marks and mars and it'll look like it'll look like somebody painted it. If you put it on in light coats, and again I'm trying to keep everything nice and flat, trying to keep it a good distance away. I shoot at about 30 pounds per square inch by the way. And I just go over it and over it and over it with light coats back and forth. And I try not to let it build up in any one particular area. Now you're going to look at this and you're going to say, huh, yeah, okay, that looks like silver. But it's not going to impress you. Let it sit for about an hour and then come back to it. And you'll notice that because it's uh, water-based acrylic, right? Everything starts to evaporate. All of the metallic crystals start to flatten out on top of each other and it gets mirror smooth, especially if you have the chrome. I'm using the aluminum right now, so it won't be as shiny, but it will look like a metal fuel tank in about an hour. Just to let you know, okay, here's the camera. Ah, uh, okay, you can't really see it because of the light went up, but it is nice and shiny, okay? But we'll come back to this in about 20 minutes to a half an hour, and we'll see how it goes from there. Ah, stay. Good boy. Now, I'm not an advocate of actually putting thinned paint back into the bottle, because that's a good way to ruin the bottle. Because it just, it, it messes with the chemistry, right? But... In this particular case, I haven't added anything to it. I haven't had to add any thinners or flow improvers or anything. So you know what? I'm going to save those few spare drops because you know you're going to need them. Skipping ahead a little bit, Hank. Uh, people are probably wondering what I'm doing back here between all these paint changes and stuff. Uh, I've talked about this before. Uh, we typically carry these in stock. We're out at the moment, but we'll get them back in. This is called an ultrasonic cleaner. And it was designed to clean dentures, jewelry, eyeglasses, all kinds of nifty things like that. It's just a very vibrating chamber. So what I do is I have a, a glass jar with lacquer thinner. See the color? That was clear when I started with it. So I put it in this glass container. I put it in my reservoir, but I put water in the reservoir. So what I'm doing is I'm keeping all my thinners and gunk into my glass jar and I'm keeping my ultrasonic cleaner clean. So in between spray coats, I have been, uh, I've been sticking my airbrushes in here, vibrating them in the lacquer thinner, taking them out, spraying a little water through them and I've been good to go. So we're changing colors that fast in here. So this helps uh, do it and it also does a nice deep clean when you're done the session. So I just thought I'd clue you into what's going on over here. Yeah, the nice thing about using uh, acrylic paints is that of course They'll break down with, uh, with, uh, with Windex and hot water. That's what this bucket is here, by the way. This is like the, the best thing you can ever do if, if you have acrylics is keep a bucket of hot water around you. You can just instantly just clean out your airbrush and you're all set to go. The next technique. Everybody wants to know. Everybody wants to know about pre-shading, post-shading, what should I do, how can I do that, what do I do, okay? Uh, the whole idea about pre-shading or post-shading is to add a little bit of difference to the color that you have. Now, when I build a model, okay, uh, this is basically what it's going to look like, okay? It's going to be just this straight gray plastic. In this particular case, this is a uh, 1 to 24 scale um, Fock Wolf 190. This is the wing. It's huge. It's a big kit. And should you have the means, I highly recommend it. I've done all my interior work. I've done all of the interior colors and I've done some weathering and some shading on the inside. And this was all done with a brush. Okay. But this isn't, this isn't the finished result. If you want to post shade, the whole idea is to add either dark or light in order to change the color of the of the of the final color that you're going to put on the camouflage. 
you can post shade like this. Now here's the here's the body of the Falk Wolf, and if you notice, it looks kind of messy and dirty. It's got a whole bunch of different. Uh, it's got a bunch of blacks and browns and everything else, all uh, done into the tail and whatnot. And this is a perfectly good, valid way. When we actually go through and we, when I actually go through and do a post shading, okay, and appreciating, this would be appreciate by the way. I'll start to clean it up a bit. And then in this particular case, let's see if I can get this in nice and close here. You'll notice that all of the rivets and the panel lines and everything else like that, um, they're going to they're going to remain black, so that when I actually put my camouflage over it, those are actually going to stand out just a little bit, and it's going to look just superb. Again, I'm working with a, with uh, with Tamea flat black here, and I'm actually cleaning it, wiping it to to get to this part with Windex. So. Another little trick that you can do with your post and your pre shading. Too much stuff on the go. So we're going to do a little bit more fun with masking, but I'm going to do a little bit of uh, pre shading for you. Going back to the wings here. Now these planes, from what I've read, they didn't get a lot of use, but they did get worn down. And the paint quality back then wasn't that good either. And as a matter of fact, there was a lot of paints that weren't necessarily, shall we say, fluent with everything. Uh, you know, one shade of brown was different from another shade of brown, even though they were the same color number. The interior of these planes were actually pretty much well left the same. Um, AK actually produces a good range of uh, World War II colors. And what I'm going to do now is actually do a little bit of painting, pre-painting, with the AK colors. And for that I use the AK thinner. It's going to take me a second here to get set up. Okay, well we're skipping ahead to another topic. You've heard Hank talk many times about future floor rocks, now known as Pledge acrylic floor finish. This stuff is a modeler's dream for clear coating. Okay? When you do your model painting, whether it be a military model and you need to clear coat it before you put your decals on, whether you do an automotive topic or anything that requires a nice sturdy gloss finish, Future, or Pledge as it's now known, is your friend. I've put it into my, I've switched to my double action gravity feed airbrush. It's a little overkill for this job, but hey, I'm having fun here. I've uh, put a tiny bit of Tamiya thinner in, mixed it with the pledge so it'll flow nice and smooth and dry quickly. It's set up on my brush and I just, I just nicely coat it. The trick to a good gloss coat, as you all know, is get as close as you can without having runs in it. And you can actually see it. You can see it's shiny when it goes on. When you do that, as you can see, you get a really nice gloss coat on that. I'll even try it on the other side. Putting it over my, my hairspray and my salt and all that good stuff. So I can either be my finished coat or I can be just setting it up to decorate. Mm -hmm. Hey, Hank, is that working? Sweet. That's future, right? That's future. I just put a little bit, I think I learned that technique from you, put a little bit of tamiya thinner. Don't try to shoot it straight out of the bottle. Yeah. And it just ever so much. Breaks the water tension. Well, it, it breaks the tension on, on the future so that when it hits the plastic, it actually smooths out and levels out. Yeah, I had a problem with cooling it out in the past, probably, because I was shooting it straight. Okay, so I've got something for you. Again, I'm going back to Silly Putty, because I like Silly Putty. As you can see, I've, I've, I've really done the inside engine part of this uh, of this Flock Wolf 190 really, really well. But I have to start painting the outside of it. And you could, again, you could put in foam or you could tape it or you could paint it before you put everything in. But then you have to touch everything up. Uh, you know, just silly putty. Silly putty can go anywhere. 
So I full painted the inside of this uh, of this cowl. I fully painted the inside of this cowl, and now I've simply masked it with, with silly putty, and now I can paint whatever I want on the outside and the inside. And that's where we're going to start next. I have uh, I have a whole bunch of interesting tools. Uh, this may seem like the cheapest cheapest little tool that you could ever find. Okay, what this is is that this is an alligator clip, right? It's an alligator clip, and it's got it's on a piece of wood, and it's sharp at one end. And you might figure, oh, I can just go and make those. And I thought I could just go and make those. But uh, you know what? I really couldn't find any alligator clips with, uh, with any metal to put a long piece of wood. So I went out and bought them from here, as a matter of fact. And it's like the best. In this particular case, I am using the sharp pointy bit to hang on to the plastic bit. And uh, we'll go from there. What I wanted to do is use the AK Interactives. And again, this color for the interior of a German aircraft, uh, RLMO2, is just spectacular. Ah, there you go, my trusty airbrush. If you're curious, I've got about eight, ten airbrushes at home, all different types, some multiples. You're not bragging, are you? No, <laughs> no. I think that's more of a fail than anything else. Most of them work. Now for the AKs, again, it's not like, they're not like tomatoes. Um, I actually thin this down a lot less. Uh, I'll go back to, uh, to Bill's ratio here. Two parts paint, one part thinner. But again, your mileage may vary. Uh, you may get a particular paint which is uh, very runny. So, uh, you know, going uh, one tenth thinner, you know, to nine parts paint might be the way to go. If you notice, I mix everything up in my cup. I don't mix anything else anywhere else. And there we go. So this paint is all set to go. I'm looking at it on the inside. It's about a milky consistency. I know you keep hearing that. You know, what's a milky consistency? Well, it's like milk. I'm going to get hit for that one later. <laughs> so anyway, one of the things. Oops. Did I mention that this was a live show? <laughs> well, technically it's not. We're recording, but that's okay. I have to shoot the insides of this thing. So, okay, I've got a good stream. Painting it out. Now, because these are exhaust flaps, well, not exhaust flaps, it's for cooling. What I might want to do later on is actually add some, some browns, very fine browns or very fine blacks, or uh, maybe put in some metal chipping. Um, you'd be surprised what people will see when they take a good long look at your models. It's surprising what they will see and you didn't even think to put it in there. That's embarrassing. But again, it doesn't take long. It's a perfect color, and it's all set to go. And that didn't take long at all. I have some other stuff. Everybody wonders, how do you paint the small bits and whatnot, right? I cheat. What this is, is that this is a piece of wood, and I put some masking tape, the thick masking tape, the wide stuff, and the sticky side is out so that it hangs onto the parts so that it doesn't fly around. This is so good because now you don't have to touch it. All you have to do is just paint. I paint it at all angles. I try and paint it all four angles. That way, because paint 
from an airbrush does not go around corners. Now when it comes to painting this kind of stuff, don't think that you're just going to airbrush everything just once and that's it. It doesn't work that way. I'll go back in and I'll use a lighter color to add some fade. I'll go in and I'll uh, maybe add some browns and some rusts and whatever else that I can find. I'll go in and I'll uh, maybe... Uh, I will not like the color and choose another color. But again, if you hit it from all four sides, at least you're going to get sufficient paint, paint coverage all the way around. And that's another argument for the airbrush. Can you imagine how long it would take to brush paint that? Days. Yeah, it takes forever. Painting of this chassis and this car. You watch me do it in minutes. You'd be sitting there with a brush, you'd be sitting there for half an hour and still doing it, I think. All right. Um.